morning, everyone. Um, good afternoon for some, good evening for others, I suspect. Um, I'm very glad to be here and to uh, participate in this webinar. I hope that you'll find the content uh, of value uh, in your laboratories. And um, if you'd like to contact me in the future at any point, uh, I'd be happy to uh, discuss uh, the topic with you one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So let's ask some questions to start. I think that's a good place to start. Um, and the, probably the most important question to ask is, where do we place negative cells when we're running our flow cytometers? So I started doing flow cytometry in 1978, and if, as I visited various laboratories and uh, the various roles I've had in my life, I would find that various people had their favorite place of way of placing a negative. They would smash it up against the baseline, they'd let it up, up and off the baseline. And the problem was is that was the wrong question to ask. So all the time we were setting the negatives in our favorite place uh, on our displays, on our flow cytometers, we were asking the wrong question. The question we should have been asking is where do we place the positive cells? Because the truth is most antigens, are, especially things like CD4, are very reproducible. And if your instruments are standardized, they should be in the same place every day. So if I run CD4, on the same patient, or on the, even multiple patients in the case of CD4, it should really be in the same place every day. And by setting the negative, what we did is we had the positive move and the negative be in the same place every day. And we weren't accurately representing the staining of that cell and the antigen density of CD4 on that cell. So the most important thing to realize is that we shouldn't have the negative in the same place every day, but the positive in the same place every day. The negative can vary depending on you know what it's a if the individual that you're running the bug from the individual you're running uh, uh, takes multiple vitamins uh, as on the chemotherapy various things inflect, uh, influence the autofluorescence of the negative and so putting the positive in, in the correct place is really the way to look at this. So how do I so now that we know we want the the positive in the same place every day I have to ask we have to ask ourselves. Well, how do we go about doing this? And if I'm setting up the instrument every day, how do I make sure that I don't have events running off scale, where the compensation error will cause false positives? And how do I optimize the dynamic range for each of my detectors? How do I know I'm getting the best performance out of that detector? How do I optimize the resolution of my data sets? How do I go about doing that? And how do I generate results that are directly comparable on the same instrument day after day? How do I do that across multiple instruments day after day? And how do I generate directly comparable quantitative results day after day on the same instrument and across multiple sites? And so as you can see, this just multiplies across as we run multiple instruments. And even if we're running different instruments, we can still standardize them. So this is a very important thing that we do every day to set up instruments correctly and make sure that they're standardized. So to, to make this happen, uh, a method was developed uh, while I was at Beckton Dickinson, and, and the reason we had to do this is we uh, had 100 instruments we had to standardize them and bring up in a period of about 30 days for one of the large customers we were working with at the time. And a number of us, Bob Hoffman, Joe Trotter, uh, Ming Yan, also Dave Parks from Stanford, um, came up with a way of, of standardizing instruments all working together. Uh, that, that has proved pretty tried and true and is, I think, almost universally used uh, by most people who buy BD instruments now. Um, and that is based on uh, beads that were developed by BD called cytometer setup and tracking beads. Uh, these beads uh, consist of uh, three different intensities, uh, standing intensities, and they don't actually have fluorochromes in them, the exact fluorochromes you would run but they have uh, fluorescent molecules in them that mimic the fluorochromes that are excited by all the various laser wave wavelengths that are commonly used in flow cytometers. Um, the reason we used the brightest of these beads for standardization, which we did, was because it exhibits the least intrinsic fluorescence due to the bead itself. So all beads, most of the beads we use are polystyrene, and they have their own autofluorescence. So by using a bright bead, we had the best possible CV for the bead and the less contribution of the fluorescence of the bead itself. So that's why we chose that one. Um, this allowed us to set uh, bright bead targets that could be used in a worksheet that could be sent across various sites and uh, allowed us to, to uh, provide that information, the standardization information based on that bead, 
across um, easily across multiple sites just simply by emailing a worksheet. Um, these were then used to create application settings, which is a feature of the software we were using at the time, uh, that could be stored and that could be updated daily. If you didn't have application settings and you had an instrument that didn't have those, you can still standardize daily by setting to the, uh, the targets as we did and then compensating the instrument. So it's possible to standardize any instrument by this method. Uh, it's just more convenient for those that, that use application settings or have a method for daily updating uh, of the target values without having it to actually run them again. So how do we go about setting up? How do we set the negative? How do we set the positive in the same place every day? How does this work? Well, uh, one of the nice things that happens uh, when you're running CSMT beads and, and a feature of the software is it characterizes the instrument. It tells you a lot about what's going on with the instrument. Um, and the, the two values that we use to uh, standardize an instrument that are very important to us are to know how much electronic noise there is in each detector and what's the maximum linearity of each of those detectors. So we're saying how much electronic noise is at the low end that's going to contribute to the, the CV, uh, the standard deviation of the negative population, and how bright can something be in that detector before it's off scale and in a region of the detector that's nonlinear, where compensation is no longer accurate.